We'll be working through the start of the in-class exercise in chapter eight. This is because we're missing this for, for the fall of 2022. Um, as a caveat, it's been a little while since I've gone through and done all of the cleanup for this particular example. So I'll be, I'll be doing it as we go and there well might be some mistakes or bugs along the way. So the start of this, we're going to start with a data set that I really think is wonderful. It's, it's from NOAA and it's a data set that gives all of their storm events on a particular year. In this example, I have used the year 2017, but you're welcome if you want to pick another year as you go through this. Just be aware if you do that some of your maps and things like that will look a little bit different because the numbers will be a little bit different. And actually, even if you get 2017, some of the results might be a little bit different from since I pulled that data and built the book when I first wrote this, which was in 2017, um, because they, they continually update that. And we'll see that when we look in the data. So for each of these, it has information about the event that happened, um, and it's got some interesting details. They include things like deaths and injuries from that particular storm event. For the data, we'll take a look at it once we get it in, but each row is a separate event, and then they've got some other pieces of information in there. So they've got an episode, and sometimes you'll have several events grouped into the same episode. Uh, they have information about the county, and they have that through a numeric ID called a FIPS code. We'll need to do a little bit to clean that up. And then um, they, for some of these, they're, they're given by county. For some, they're given for something called a forecast zone. And that's in a column. And for this exercise, we're pulling this data so we can pair it up with, um, with some geographic data that we have on counties. So we'll actually limit the data set just to be the county so we can focus on those. So as the first step, you need to get the data. So you can go to this link. This has, as you can see, a lot of files in it. So they have these storm events all by files. They're all this um, uh, in a compressed format. And um, they have different types of them. So they have details files, that's what we're gonna pick. But they also have some with more information on fatalities, and then they have some with some more information on the, on the location. So you can feel free to explore those some more if you want, but we're going to focus on the ones that are just these details. So scroll down until you find the 2017. That's the example I used. Again, if you wanted to, you could use one of the more current ones and see if you get things that are different. So I'll click on that and download it. Once you do, on a Mac at least, if you double click, you're able to unzip the file, get it so it's uncompressed just by double clicking on it. This can be different on different systems. So if you are using Windows, you might wanna use whatever else you use to, to decompress files on that. The other alternative, I believe you might be able to use read underscore CSV or read.csv, one of those two, to read in directly from the compressed format. So if you have Windows and you don't know a good way to unzip these files, you might wanna try the same thing we're doing, but try it with that full file name and it might actually work for you. All right, the next thing I am going to move this so that I have it in the same uh, directory where, where I'll be working. And I made an example called in class October and that, that I have running as an R project, but I'm just going to use my file folder to move that over. All right, so if I go in, you can see now that I have that that file with a nice long name and I'm gonna open an R script and I'll call this um, maybe example in class all right so the first thing that we we need to do now is to get this into R We'll try using read CSV from the reader package. And since we'll be wanting to use some other tidyverse stuff, I'll just do the whole tidyverse package. Let me see if there's something I ask you to name it so I can be consistent. Okay, Storms 2017, it looks like is the name that I use. So I'll use that name just to be consistent here. So I'm gonna do read CSV. 
And I can actually use tab completion to find that name because it's a really long name and it's really easy to have a typo. So what I did was in this read CSV, as soon as I did the quotation marks, I pressed the tab key and that gives up the options for things that are in this directory. And then you can just pick the one. And if you do the first letter, it'll actually bring that up to the top. And if you, if you want, you can even just do a tab to complete at that point. So let's try that and see if that works. All right, it looks like it did. It's giving us some information down here about what it read in, uh, but there's no error about things not working well. We can double check if we want to see. I know some of you like to use view as well, and that's fine too to kind of like open up and see it here, or some people click over here and that does the same thing as running view. Okay, so we can see that we've got a lot of stuff here, which is often the case when you're using um, data from these public sources that, that will have lots of really good information. And a lot of times you don't need all of that information. So one of our early things is going to be to limit this to just the stuff that we need and then to simplify things a little bit um, and, and do a little bit of cleaning up to get it in the format we need to move forward. So you can see there's a lot of information here. Again, each of these rows is one of these disaster events. And um, let me see, we'll open up this way so we can kind of scroll and see there too. So we've got information about the date in terms of when the event started. And then we've got information about the end. And for some of the events, it's going to be exactly the same. A lot of the events are kind of it instantaneous, at least in the recording, but some of them might go on for a few days. We have this event ID, and this will be unique for every row in the data set, but then we also have an episode ID, and this is a case where things um, that happen as part of the same weather system, for example, might all have the same episode ID, but then there might be different events in terms of things like if there was flooding and it was in multiple counties, then you might have an event for each county, but they're all part of the same episode. Or if you have um, uh, different tornadoes that are spawned, each of those tornadoes might have a different event ID, but then they're all part of the same system that was going through. Next, we have some information about the location. So we've got the state here. We've also got the state FIPS, and we'll see later that we have some FIPS information on a more local level. And we'll be using that to join things together. So the FIPS codes are really, really nice and really useful because they give a numeric code uh, for the state and then also for the county, which joins together a state piece and a county piece. Uh, but it's really great because sometimes if you just use the names to try to join things, if there was any difference in spelling, if there was a difference in punctuation, for example, if, if one spelled out Saint for St. Louis and one did ST for St. Louis and one did ST dot for St. Louis, um, those three, if you try to join by name, they wouldn't join together. But these, these FIPS um, are a much more consistent way to do it. So anytime you see those, if you're working with county level data, that that is typically a better way to join things together. All right, this is again some more information about when it happened. Then we have some stuff about what type of event it was. Uh, and we'll be using that some as we go into ma to maps and we might want to do things like facets so that we can show a map of events that were tornadoes and events that were thunderstorms and events that were floods and all of that. The next is a CZ type. So some of these events, and this, this varies by the event type, some of them are recorded by county and some of them are recorded by what's called a forecast zone. All of these here have a C, so those are all a county. Uh, if we scroll down some, we're seeing some of these like winter weather and the marine ones. These are all recorded by Z. So um, when we get to the CZ FIPS, that's linked up to what was here in the CZ part. Uh, if this was C, then the CZ FIPS part, that is giving more of the FIPS code for the county. If it was for Z down here, it's giving a code for the forecast zone. So we'll be getting rid of all of the ones that have a Z and focusing on the ones that are a county. And then we'll, we'll need to do some work to kind of clean up uh, these and put them with the state FIPS. And I'll explain that some more when we get to that point. We've also got the county name. Um, we've got a little bit 
more information here that's kind of date related. So here we've got the begin date time where they actually put all of the date information together. So that might be helpful because earlier we saw this information, but it was spread out with a with a month, one column for a month, and one for a year, one for for a time, and all of that. And then here we get into some of our information about the impacts that it had. So we've got the the number of injuries, both direct and indirect, uh, the number of, of deaths, again, direct and indirect, uh, damage to property, damage to crops, how they got this information. There are a number of ways that they get information in. Um, and a little bit more information that we're not going to use much. This A lot of this um tends to be specific to the type of event and will show up as missing for a lot of events that that aren't relevant. So for example, all of these are pieces of information for tornadoes. So they'll only have values if it's a tornado. For here with the flood cause, these are all information about what that cause was, but then they're only going to show up if the event type was flood. So I believe from here on out, we are not going to use this stuff, although we might come back for some of the things like like tornadoes and thunderstorms. They actually have point locations for where they begin and where they end. And we could use these for mapping to kind of show the, the tracks of the tornadoes, for example. But most of what we'll focus on, at least to start with, will be to uh, to just show the county as a shape and with the color show the number of events that we have for different things. Uh, as we go through, there's a little bit more. These episode narratives give information about the episode as a whole and the event for that specific event. And we're not going to do loads of work with these, but they're actually, this is a really interesting part of this data set. And uh, you might at some point want to go through and take a peek at some of these because it's really interesting to read through what the actual events were. A lot of times when we have this kind of public source data, the, the story behind it has been stripped out. But in this case, we actually have the stories in here in these narrative parts. And a lot of these get really, really long because they're, they're um, talking through a lot of stuff. All right, so we got the data in and all of that is looking really great. So let's see what the next step is. All right, so we're gonna start to make this data set a little bit simpler. We're gonna limit the data frame to just a few things. So we're gonna pick the beginning and ending dates and times, episode ID, event ID, state name and FIPS, the CZ name, type and FIPS, event type, the source, the beginning, uh, latitude and longitude. Ah, so we will use that at some point in the ending latitude and longitude. So let's go in uh, and do that. The first thing we can see all of the things here that we have all of our column names. So we'll use these to kind of pick out what we want to grab. But um, we can already kind of tell that um, we're if, if we're narrowing down in terms of the number of columns that we have, we're going to do that with select. So let's take a look. I'm going to start with building my code without reassigning it so that I don't keep having to read in this big data set every time I mess something up. So I'll kind of use uh, the code down here to get it like I want to have it. And then I'll clean it up a little bit later by reassigning to this new name. So I have so I have that in the final version. Um, so I think the first thing that I'm going to do, and I don't know if I do this in the example code that's in the book, but I think it would probably be helpful. Um, I don't like that all of these column names are uppercase because that's going to be a real pain to to write every time. So I'm going to do the rename all and with the rename all, you can put in a function that you want to do. So I don't use this loads. A lot of times I have to look up the help file um, to make sure I'm doing it right. But I think this might be right. Yeah, yeah, that did it. So this is saying we want to rename all of the columns and the function we want to use is that string to lower from the stringer package. Because we loaded tidyverse, we've got that loaded. If you had loaded reader instead, just reader, you might need to go back up and, and load stringer as well. Uh, but it looks like that works. And now we have these these names that are a little bit simpler. All right, so now let's start looking through our list and adding things in. So first we need to do the beginning and ending dates and times. 
So we could do that by getting the column with year, month, day, and time right here. But I think we came across that other one. Yeah, this begin date time and end date time. I think those will work. And let's just check to see. Okay, it looks like the way we're doing this is working well. So we can keep on just lining up what we need to get. Okay. So we've got those, and it looks like that'll have all the information. It's not in a, in a date time yet, but we can run Libre Date on that and get it in the right format when we get to that stage. All right, the next thing that we needed to do, beginning and ending dates and times, we've got that. Okay, so the episode ID and the event ID. Let's look at those column names again to see which those would be called. Event ID. It's right here, and I think the other one was episode ID. Yeah, all right, and I'll check that again. Great. All right, then the next thing, the state name and FIPS, and then the CZ name type and FIPS. Okay, let's look for those. Okay, so that's going to be state and then state fits. And then for the next one, it was the CZ type and then the CZ fits. All right. Okay, next ones that we want are event type the source, and then we want this beginning and ending latitude and longitudes. Okay, so the event type, right there. All right, the source was the next one. Let's just call it source. And then for the last one, we wanted to do the, oh my goodness, there's so many column names here that it's actually running off the page when we do it. So to get the rest, what we can do is do call names of storms 2017. This is a base R thing, but it'll work for us, I think. All right, so we want to do begin lat, begin long, in lat, and in long. Those are all in a row, so we can actually, if we want, do that 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 um, colon to say everything between begin lat and end long. All right. Okay, that works. That looks like they, that's gotten us everything that we wanted. Okay, so now that we've got all of that set, I'll reassign this. And yeah, that looks good. So we're ready to move forward with that. All right, next thing we're going to do some cleaning up. So for the first one, um, we are going to get our times in a date time class. So let's do that. Again, I'm going to start out not assigning this to anything so I can make sure I have the code right. And I'll probably put all this code to clean stuff up in kind of one pipeline. And um, that'll, that'll be nice and, and kind of like condensed, I guess, for that. Um, okay, so I'm going to do mutate because we want to change a column that exists, and we'll need to do this for both of the columns. There's also, I should say, I'll do this in two steps, but just like there's the rename all here that we use, there's a mutate at, and if you're doing the same thing, like here we're doing the same thing to two columns, you can actually use the mutate underscore at to do that. It can be really helpful if you're trying to do the same thing to 10 or 20 columns. Um, in this case, it's probably simpler just to do the mutate because again, mutate apps the kind of thing that I do every now and then, but because I don't do it all the time, I have to actually uh, think about how it works. Whereas with mutate, that's one that, that um, I don't have to think about too much usually anymore. Okay, so we're gonna work with the begin date time. And uh, we'll just replace the one here with the new one where we've done that transformation with the time. So I can't remember if tidyverse includes LibreDate or not. To be safe, I'll leave LibreDate. And then with LibreDate, 
we just need to make sure we say what order things are happening in. So this is going to be a day, a month, and a year. So day, month, year, and an underscore. And then we've got the hour, minute, and second. So we'll do the HMS one. And then that's going to be the begin daytime. All right, let me check. Okay, it looks like that worked well. And you can see I'm running to check it here, but because I'm not reassigning it, it'll work for me to run again. If you had reassigned this, then if you tried running this again, you'd get an error because it would already be in this class. And for, for these lubricate functions to work, you need to be inputting something that's a character string, something that's not already in a date or a date time class. All right. We'll do the same thing with the end date time. All right, that's all looking good. The next thing that we want to do is to change the state and county names uh, to be title case. Oh, I think I missed something. I think that we wanted to get the county name as well. So let me go back here and then I think it was maybe CZ name. All right, that looks like that got it. Okay, so let's do that. And that's going to be um, state. And then this is one where we can use that string to, uh, and in this case, we're going to do string to title. So we, we use string to lower, and I think maybe you've used string to upper. That The string to lower will take everything and turn it into lowercase. String to upper will take everything and turn it into uppercase. The string to title will take it and it'll change it to the first letter is uppercase in each word, and then the rest are lowercase, which is, a, I think, a nicer way to see this. Um, so we'll do that, and we'll do that with state. And we can check to make sure that worked like it what we wanted. And you can see here the change that that's made. Before, everything was in all caps. And now you can see that it's just the first letter that's capitalized. All right, and then we were going to do it to, to CZ name as well. All right, that's all set. So the next thing, we want to limit to the events that are listed by county FIP. So this is getting to that CZ type. We want to only keep the rows where that is C and then get rid of the ones where that is uh, um, Z. So if we look, let me see, and that's not going to have all the changes yet. I don't think we need to look. OK, so what we're doing here is we're getting rid of some of the rows. Right, so we're gonna take the rows where where that CZ type that we can't see right here, but where CZ type is a C, we're gonna keep those and we're gonna get rid of ones where that is not the case. Anytime you're taking a data set and simplifying it by getting rid of some rows and you're doing it based on some kind of logic, like the value in the CZ type column equals C. Anytime you do that, you're going to want to use a filter. Filter is how you limit the number of rows, get rid of some of the rows in your data set, doing it based on logic. If you were doing it just based on where they were in the data frame, you could use slice. Like if you just wanted to keep the first 10 rows, you could use slice to do that. Um, but filter is the way if we're doing it based on logic. So we're going to filter. And when you do filter, you just do the things that you want to keep. So we are going to filter to where CZ type is equal to a capital C. All right, so we've gone through. And a good way for checking with uh, the filter that it worked like you wanted is to compare the number of rows before and after. So before we did that, we had 57,000 rows, more or less. And after, we're down to 36,000. So this, 37,000 or so. This is taking out some rows, so it seems like that is probably um, doing what we wanted to do. Okay, the next step, this is maybe um, the only one that, that might be a little bit confusing why we're doing it and that might introduce some things that you haven't really seen before in terms of how we do it. So um, if we take a look, let me, for right now, I'm just going to add on a select here so we can see the parts I want to show you. Um, 
but we'll take it off later because because we're not we're not saving this anywhere to anything this is just giving me a chance to look okay so we're going to look at the state's fifth state fifths and the season fifths all right so here's the information for that so the way that these fips work are that for county fips it is going to be a five digit code that is a unique code and you can see with this example, this row six, how this is going to work. So there are two digits that are reserved for the state, and then there are three that are reserved for the county. And to get the, the FIPS in a format that will make it easy for us to line it up with the other data that we have, data that we're getting in um, that's geographic, so we can do maps of this, um, the, the best thing to do is to get this into a five-digit code. With this particular example, row six, we could do that just by pasting, and that would work well. Same thing with row seven. That would give us five, one, one, nine, three. That's exactly what we want at the end of the day. But the problem is these have been read in as numbers, and really we should think, be thinking of them more as characters. And when it read in these numbers, if there was a zero at the beginning, it stripped it out. So there's some of these right now that in terms of numbers only have four digits. So the FIPS code for this one, once we get it all set, should be 34015. But you can see that zero got lost because it was at the beginning here. For some of them, even the zero for the state is gone. So here, the, ultimately, this one should be 05047. And you can see we're missing that because um, these were read in as digits and the zero at the beginning was just stripped off from the digits. So what we're doing next is going to be to sort this out. And it turns out stringers actually got a pretty cool function called string pad that's going to let us do that. So again, we're making some changes to columns. Um, and I'll go back. Let me take out that part where we were selecting because we want to keep all the other stuff we had. I just wanted you to be able to see for now. Um, well, actually, maybe it would be easier while we work through to keep it out, but we'll go back and get rid of that at the end. And I'll probably forget, and then I'll have to fix everything, but we'll give it a go. Okay, so we're going to replace the state fifths, and we want to replace it by adding on a zero to the beginning uh, if it only has one digit, and leaving it the same if it doesn't. So we could write that up as some complex code, but fortunately, there's this wonderful function called string pad. So what this does, the first thing is you put in the column that you're working on. Then you say with width, how wide you want that to be once you're done with everything. We that want that to be two. So in other words, we want to have two digits here. You can say where you want to do that padding. The, the default is going to be this left, and that's where we want to do it here. So if there's only one digit here, we want to put the zero to the left of it. So that'll work fine. We could put side equals left, but we could also ju just leave it with the default, and that'll get us there. And then we need to tell it what we want to pad with. So we want to pad with a zero here. So let me run that, and you can see. So now you can see that it's changed these state ones to a character. And in the case where we had that single digit, it has added a zero to the left. All right, let's do the same thing for the CZ FIPS now. In this case, we want the final width to be three. So that'll give us the five digits because the, the maximum value for these is three. So it's 18155. And this is information, like understanding how these FIPS codes work. Um, that's something that, that comes a little bit with doing a lot of work with this scale of geographic data, because this is just a convention for how, um, for how states can be identified, sorry, counties can be identified across the country. So for that one, we'll do a width of three and we'll pad with zeros as well. So if we look at that, so now we can see that when we, now that we're ready to, to kind of paste these together, we're going to have these in a state where it all gets uh, to five digits, which is exactly what we want. So we're all set here to stick these together. There are a few ways we could do that. We could paste if we wanted. And uh, I think I ask you, yes, I ask you to use Unite for that, which is a little bit more efficient. 
And with Unite, we're going to name that, that column FIPS. So let's do Unite. And then the call equals, let me see, let me look at the help file. This is another one I don't use often enough to know off the top of my head what the convention is. But I'm going to look down here at the example. Okay, so Unite, it looks like first I put what I want the name to be. So I want it to be called FIPS. And then the ones that I'm uniting are the state FIPS to, oh, you could probably do with a concatenate here because they don't think they're right after each other. All right, in this case, we do want to get rid of the old one, I think. Okay, so we're so close. But two things. First of all, when we do unite, we don't want that underscore. So I think we need to tell it what we want to have in between. Yes, with that sep. So we'll say sep equals and just put nothing. And the other thing is, as predicted, I forgot to get rid of this. So let's get rid of that. And now we can see. Um, and we've got that FIPS all as a five digit code, just like we want it. This is also a format that a lot of other data sets that are uh, related to county will have the county as that five digit FIPS code. So if you're ever doing work with county level data, uh, this kind of process is an excellent one to know because I, I run into a lot of cases where I need to do this to clean things up. All right, the next one, change all the column names to lowercase. We actually did that at the very beginning, so we're all set on that. All right, so I think we've gotten through big things here. So let me reassign now. And we can take a look and see. And we can see we've got our cleaned up version now, which is all looking really great. All right. So now we're just down to these last few. Um, at this point, we want to bring in some more information about the state. We want to bring in the area of the state and bring in what region it's in. Uh, and there you can already see down here kind of where we're going with that. Some of the regions are northeast, south, north, central, and west. So there's a data set that comes with R called data state. Let's come over here and in my scripts, I like to put the part where I load libraries and where I load data that's coming from packages in R. I like to put all of that up at the top. And that's because if I send the script to someone else, they can pretty quickly look through and see what packages they're going to need to install if they don't have them installed already, instead of kind of having those buried along the way. So they can get their setup done uh, before they go forward. All right, so we did that that state. We can take a look and see what it looks like. And since we're just looking, we could come down here to do it. Hmm. They might have divided this up into different data sets since the last time I did this. It does look like it's different vectors. So when we did that that state, we got all the information that we're going to need, like the area, the name, and so on. But it doesn't look like it's letting us do it just by itself. So this actually will be a difference from the example that we have in here, I think. And I think that comes from a change in that data set. Oh, no, no, that's always been the case. All right, so we're going to use this this code to take these different pieces and put them all into a data frame. So in other words, it's just giving us different vectors here. And we'll create this US state info by taking the state name vector that we got from doing the data state and the state area and the state region, and it'll put it all into a data frame. Oh, we should use Tibble instead. All right, let's use Tibble instead. There we go. All right, so if you look at that, you can see that we've got the state, we've got the area, and we've got the region. 
Because in our storms data, we did it so that the state had that title case, you can see that these line up. So we'll be able to stick these together. So what we want to do at this stage is we want to get this information about area and region paired up with the information that we have here about the different events. So we have two data sets. We have a piece of information, the state that is the same on both of them that we can use to match information in here to put it in the storms database. So this is a classic example of when we want to do a join. This is the data set that we really care about in this case. So I'll use a left join. We want to make sure we keep everything that's in here. But if there is a state that does not have a disaster, which won't be the case, but if there were, we would want to um, to just get rid of that, that one and not have missing values. And I take it back. It could be that there's something in this data set like Puerto Rico or something like that that we might not uh, have in here. I can't remember if this data set um, covers territories as well. All right, so we can go in now and we're going to go back. This is a change we're making to the Storms 2017 is to join in this new data. Again, I'm going to do it without reassigning. So if we mess something up, it's pretty easy to just start new from here instead of having to reload everything from the very beginning. All right, so we're going to left join the US state info and um, we were very kind to ourselves in naming this with the same column name that we had in the other, so I think that should work. Great, so you can see this is a long data frame, but you can see the area and region were added in. And once we go back and reassign it, we can check it in the viewer too, but we won't see it until then. But it looked like this worked like we wanted. All right, so let's see what the next thing is now that we have that. All right, so now we're going to do a data set with the number of events per state, I think. So let's go ahead and save that because I think that's our last big change to that data set. And since we saved it, we can look here and we can see. Um, so we can see here this is in New Jersey and we've added in that, that region is the north, the northeast and we've added in what the area is. So this looks like we want at this stage. All right, so we want to create the number of events per state in this year. So anytime you see this per kind of thing and we have that information, this is often going to be a group by and then either a summarize or a count. Uh, remove any states that are not in the state information data frame. Oh, so maybe, Maybe we did want to do an inner join then. Well, let's see. At this point, we can probably get it done with a filter too to have uh, this removed. So we'll keep an eye on this as we get through, but I don't feel like going back and doing the other thing right now. And I think we can still achieve the same thing with some code from here. So I'll show you how to do that and I'll show you how we check as we go through. All right. So let's call this like storm say summary maybe. And for this, we're going to start with the storms. All right, we are going to group by the state. And then are we just trying to get maybe any states that are not? We're trying to get this plot where we've got for each state, we've got the, um, the land area. You know what, if we do the summarize where we've already put in that other information about the state, like the area and the region, when we summarize, we're going to lose some of that right now. And I can show you that. So if we group by state and then we do count, for example, that'll work. But what it gives us is just the information on the state and the end. We've lost that information about the area and the region. And the same thing, like another way that we could do this is we can do summarize and use this end function. That This is just a longer way of doing count, but it can be nice in some cases if there are other things you wanted to include. So we can do that. If we do that, you can see again, we've lost it. So there are a few things we could do to fix this. One of them is uh, inside uh, summarize, you could also do use a function called first and this will just take the first value of something which if 
it's always the same. This is one way to let things kind of like um, come come through your summarize. Uh, so we could do that with both of them. Let's take a look at that. So you can see that's pulled it in. Oh, and there were some events that were in places that were not in the state data set. So it is uh, kind of important how we do the join, it looks like. And we're probably going to need to do an inner join. So we're kicking some of those out. Or we could filter at this point the ones where the area is missing. Um, so anyway, you can, you can do these kinds of things to pull that all the way through. But probably the most efficient thing for us to do would be just to design it in a slightly different way. Instead of joining here, we'll wait and we'll join after we've done this. So let's go and run from the beginning because I'd already kind of assigned that so that we get it. Um, we, we get it so it's all running correctly. So now we have our state storm, our storm state summary. And now let's try joining that with this US state info. And that'll be a more efficient way for us to get all this stuff in without having to add in those first things when we when we do the summarize. Okay, so uh, we want to keep only the things with matches in both. And so instead of that left join we have before, we'll do the inner join. And then again, the by is by state. Here we go, let's do with this. Oh, I forgot to put the other thing we want to join in. That's why it's giving me grief. There we go. Let's try that. All right. So we're all set here. So now we have each state. I think these are the 50 states. So it's it's not just the continental. It's also Alaska and Hawaii, but it doesn't include... Um, what was it, American Samoa and things like that, that, that um, we had some missing data on before. So we've got all of those and we've got the number of storm events that were recorded in this database in 2017 in that state. We've got the area of the state. Um, so a measure of how big it is in terms of geography, not in terms of population, just in terms of, of, of the size of the land. And then we've got the region that it's in. So we're all set now with what we need to make the plot. Now we do need to go back and make sure that we actually reassign that so that it's ready for us to use because we didn't have that reassignment or I didn't uh, so that I could get it right before I did that. Okay, but this we know is gonna go straight into this plot. So let's look at this plot. First of all, it's a scatter plot so we know we're gonna do geom points. Second, we can see what the two, uh, what we're going to map to the x-axis and what we're going to map to the y-axis. So let's start with that and then we'll think of what our next level is going to be. So we're going to go into ggplot. We know it's a geom point and we know x is going to be the land area, which what do we name that column right now? That's called area. And then y is going to be the number of events. That's our n right here. So let's see what that looks like. Okay, great. So we've got a really good start right now. And we could go ahead and we know that we're going to change those two labels. So this one we're going to change to the land area square miles. So it's x. And then for Y, we're going to change it to number of storm events. Okay, great. So, so far, so good. Okay, so, um, and it looks like there are not any other changes. We, we could use the scales package to show these numbers differently because right now you can see that they're they're kind of using like scientific notation in a way that's not super pretty. So you could change that if you want it with the scales. Um, same thing here, you could actually add some commas in for these since they're up in the thousands and the way to do that would be with the scales package as well. Um, 
and then do the labels equals comma or the or, or some of the other tricks there but it looks like we don't need to do that for this one um, I think the one other thing that we need to do now though is we want to use the color to show the region so that again will be a mapping and that's the mapping of the color Okay, so that's given us the different colors there. Right here, it's looking all squished compared to what it looks like here, but that's just um, a function of the, the resolution that we have. So, you know, if we, if we zoom that, then we can get that in the proportions we want, or if we were doing our markdown, we could change the fig width and the fig height to get it to the shape that we want. Um, and then at this point we can save the image or copy the image and you can also go through from here and you can do export if you want or you can also do a gg save there's a function type them that's the name of the function and that will uh, let you save straight from the script um, what you want to save okay so i think that got everything for us yeah and once you do this take a look at it i think it's really interesting to look around uh you see some things like in the west region there tend to be fewer storm events per number per land area in square miles and we've even got like our biggest outlier there right here um i would encourage you to maybe pause and take a second to see if you can guess what this is and then I can tell you. So if you have paused, this is this is Alaska. So Alaska is really massive. Uh, so that's why it's an outlier out here. But then you see that there are very few storm events. So you want to start questioning your data when you look at stuff like this and, and think through what that tells you or what it might imply about what you're doing. And uh, there's nothing wrong with the code here or anything like that. But what's happening is that for many of these storm events, um, they rely on there being a person there to see and report the event. So a lot of this still relies on spotters and things like that. A lot of it might rely the the standards for actually reporting the event for certain types of events might involve that there was some impact to humans. And so as you get to areas that have a, a lot fewer people per square square mile, you end up getting a less, a lower density of these storm events. And it's not because the weather isn't causing them there. It's because there's nobody there to see them and get them in this database, essentially. Um, so yeah, always there are interesting things about how data get collected that are useful to know as you start using that data. And here, I think that's a really interesting and useful thing to understand is that um, everything that happens doesn't make it into this database. A lot of times it is relying on a person to see it or to report it or, or even the equipment being there in some cases, but you're not going to have a lot of weather recording equipment someplace where there are not a lot of people. All right, so that wraps up uh, this part of the exercise and I've put example code in um, some of it's probably pretty similar, but I didn't look at it really closely before I did this. So some of it might be kind of different this time. So a different way of doing things. The other thing I ask you to do is to try out some ggplot extensions. So you can go and if you Google ggplot extensions, it'll take you and there, there's a page for those. There's also a gallery. So you can go to this page or you could go straight to the gallery. I'll go here first. And you can see that that also takes you. To the gallery. So this, these are all extensions that build on ggplot in different ways and do some very cool things. Um, they're written by lots and lots of different people. So just be aware, we, we've been using mostly tools up till now that are built by teams of people who um, this is part of their job to, to build the software. A lot of the tidyverse kind of falls in that category. Um, as we move into some kind of cool new stuff, a lot of it might be stuff that's built more by kind of volunteer open source software developers where they have a whole nother job but found a cool way to do something and have made their own package for it. All that to say, there will be some that might be a little bit trickier to use. There might be some that, um, that 
you get some errors when you try the examples or uh, things along those lines. Um, but I think well worth trying because there's just so much wonderful stuff and, and um, you can definitely find stuff that's really great to, to use for the things that you're doing. And a lot of times it's just stuff that is so cool that you had no idea that anybody had even thought of it. So what I want you to do here is I want you to go through these ggplot extensions and pick out a few that look interesting and just try them out. So I'm going to show you somehow you can do that. Um, I wanted to, to make a note. First of all, I'm going to start leaving this crayon only up. So this is limiting it only to these packages that are on crayon. So the ones that you could get doing install.packages and then doing the name of, of the package. And we'll look at it in a second. There's some cool ones that are not on crayon too, and we can talk about how you can get those, um, but I'll start here. So you've got all kinds of stuff. There's some where you can create ggplots that are actually animated. Um, let me see. This one is one that I have a lot of students who um, who end up using it some for their research and have find it, found it helpful. So it lets you go through and create more kind of like publication quality stuff. And one of the things that um, in certain fields students often want to do is to be able, if they're making multiple comparisons, to be able to add some information about the, the significance level or the p-value for different comparisons they're making. So this is allowing you to add on to your ggplot where you show the distributions of the different data. It, it's showing on top of that that like when we do this test where we compare um, 0.5 dose to a dose of one, um, this is giving an indication of the statistical significance for the difference between those two. Uh, so that could be interesting. And if you'll notice when I found something that looked kind of cool, I clicked on it and it will take you to different things for different ones. In this case, it's taking us to the vignette. Um, and this is put up in, in um, using, using another package in R that lets you make those vignettes that are actually like a web page rather than just the, the PDF that you scroll through. But this functions as a normal vignette where you can go through and it's, give, it's showing you some different things you can do with it and giving you example code to try it out. So you could go through and you could try out this example code and kind of work through to see how that's working out to these different plots that they're, that they're showing if this is something that is interesting to you. Um, some of the others, let me see. I think this was looking kind of cool. Scroll through before. So here it's taking you to a GitHub page instead. But again, in the readme down at the bottom of that, they have put some information in and actually they put quite a lot. So this is looking pretty similar to a vignette where you could work through this code and come up uh, with some of the, the different plots that you might want to look at. Um, Calplot is, is actually a very well-known one of these. This one's very, very helpful. Uh, you have worked before where you've done faceting. This one lets you do multi-panel figures. So when you facet, it's almost like you're getting these little panels that work together, but you might want to add on different types of plots too. So this whole thing actually is one plot from ggplot, but they've created it by making one object that was this ggplot, another one that was this one, another that was this one, and then this calplot lets you put those together into a multi-panel figure, which can be really nice. Uh, this one was kind of cool. It lets you do all kinds of interesting things with text. So like here, it's letting you um, put some that should be in italics, let, they let you put them in italics. Um, here, it's letting you put in little images down for, uh, for the labels on one of your axes, which is kind of cool. Um, letting you do a lot more in terms of what you put in those, those different labels. Uh, yeah, so just all kinds of stuff. Oh, here it's letting you actually like put the text so it follows wiggly angles. This GG Signif, I think, is doing a similar thing to the thing I showed before. So there's all kinds of stuff. So ju just go through and pick some that you find interesting and try them out. Um, oh, I wanted to show this one too. I hadn't seen this one before today. So this one will let you take data that's text and it kind of lays it out in the pages. But what that lets you do is go through 
And you could do things like every time there's a really long word, you could highlight that. Um, and then this is pairing up some text with uh, sentiment analysis to see kind of like positive and negative sentiment. This is one where it's showing there are different types of sentiment. So joy, negative, positive, sadness. So you can kind of like see different parts of, of the book or the chapter. Or, I mean, I guess you could do this with your dissertation or your master's thesis or whatever and, and see what parts are very negative or what parts have really long words or where you're using a word that you use too often or whatever. But um, kind of a cool presentation because it's trying to take all of this information where you would have lots of and lots of text and let you kind of um, pick out points that look look pretty interesting. Okay, so loads of these um, for uh, that are on CRAN and for those you just install it by doing install that packages. There are even more that are not just on CRAN and you might want to check those out too. The reasons they would be not on CRAN, one would be that they're on Bioconductor instead um, and that would be particularly common for things that are um, related to bioinformatics. But some of these, the, the people just might still be developing them and they might be, you know, stable enough that they can put them on this, but they might still have them on GitHub and kind of be waiting until they get their final version to put it on CRAN. Or might just not want to mess with putting it on CRAN. There are some extra steps you have to take to do that. Um, so this will show you all the ones you saw before, but there'll be some new ones at that point too. Um, and those are those are kind of cool as well. Like I think this GG just I don't think was there before. I was looking through that was kind of cool. You might want to check that out. Um, one of my favorites, if I can find it, just because it looks so cool, is this one with the GG anatogram. And for that one, you can actually take data where you have different values for different parts of the body, for different parts of your mouse, for different parts of your cell, and um, you can actually map to that element, just like you map to an X or a Y axis. Um, in, in terms of like, like essentially these are all little polygons that are, that are GM. So you can map color and all to all of these. So I think that one's pretty cool. And this one's just on GitHub. So typically if ones are just on GitHub, a lot of times they might say how you could install it, but um, it, it's using, you, you can get it done with a library called DevTools. So this DevTools, if you install it, it it does require you to do some extra setup. So you have to have, I think, X11 on if you're doing it on Mac and something called RTools if you're doing it on Windows. And then um, for the RTools on Windows, you have to get that from CRAN as a separate download. Like you have to actually go to the CRAN web page and look for RTools and download. And it's kind of a big download. Uh, for X11, that's something that you find in the App Store. But once you have that, that package has install underscore GitHub. And then you can put in the information about um, from GitHub. I believe it's like this, this information you would put in in quotations to be able to grab it. But if you find something that you really love that's not on CRAN among these ggplot extensions and you're having any problems uh, getting it installed, you can ask me in class and I can help out with that too. All right. I think that that wraps up this exercise then. Um, I look forward to seeing you all on Monday.